Hello, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, today we're going to talk about a topic that may seem to some of our listeners as a, a little bit off topic, which is the Internet of Things. But uh, there is a very interesting connection here in that uh, some people, including our guests today, think that the blockchain is going to play a really important part in that. And uh, we have, I think, perhaps the best person on this topic today on the show, uh, which is, who is Paul Brody. So thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, so Paul was, uh, until recently, he was the Vice President of Technology, uh, no, uh, of Mobile and Internet of Things at IBM. And uh, IBM wrote a very interesting uh, white paper on how the blockchain can, will play a really important or could play a really important part in uh, the Internet of Things and sort of saving the Internet of Things uh, of the future. And they've also done an interesting demo at uh, Adapt and Develop a Prototype, which I think is Ethereum based. So we're gonna we're gonna have a chance to talk uh, to dive into that today and, and get an understanding of why these two technologies uh, should connect and, you know, sh could work together so well. Um, so, Paul, can you, f a lot of people will probably uh, not have a very good understanding of what the Internet of Things even is. Can you give a brief introduction to that topic? Uh, sure. So the Internet of Things, the idea behind the Internet of Things is that we've been, over the last 20, 30 years, uh, computing prices have been coming down and down and down, and we've gone from mainframes to mini computers to servers to PCs and phones, and now we're really starting to talk about connecting up all of the devices. We can start to put computing power in everything, doorknobs, light bulbs, uh, desk chairs, you name it, if it's a thing, it's going to become smart and connected. And so the Internet of Things is really talking about this era where we're right on the edge of now, which is the one where every device, everything that's around us is going to be smart and connected. Is that desirable, <laughs> in your opinion, <laughs> that everything around us is connected? Well, I, you know, this is actually a really fair question. and. Uh, one of the most important things that we, we spend a lot of time thinking about is, is it desirable? Why do we want to do that? And um, I think very simply the answer is, it's only desirable if it makes the thing in question better. If it's not making it better, then it's uh, not necessarily a great idea to connect it. Um, that being said, I'm a technology optimist. I really think uh, done correctly, almost everything can be made better if we make it smarter and connected. Yeah, I mean, I think the Internet of Things are also these uh, visions, you know, of, uh, I guess, some sort of totalitarian surveillance or, or robots taking over. I think those are, are really uh, closely connected also with that. I remember there are, uh, there are a few uh, science fiction books, perhaps you know them as well, from a guy named William Hurtling. I, I like quite a lot because he, he tries to be sort of very realistic in terms of um, how it could happen. And uh, of course, there the Internet of Things, in a way, start to play a really important role because then AI can basically use the Internet of Things to actually start having, uh, you know, basically hiring their own data centers and started building their own things and getting information. So it's uh, it, there are definitely also these these crazy futuristic scenarios, and a lot of them are very closely related to the Internet of Things as well, no? I, I, for one, don't think they're all that crazy. And if anything, what we've learned over the last couple of years is that we live in a surveillance state which is more extensive and, frankly, at least for me, more frightening than anything that could have been imagined in the novel 1984. Uh, uh, the, l the level of sort of detailed surveillance on us is, is really astonishing. And um, if there's one thing that I personally am concerned about and I think a, a lot of my colleagues wanted to, at IBM wanted to see was we want the promise of the Internet of Things to be realized without this, without creating a kind of a dystopian nightmare of surveillance. Uh, people should be able to have and enjoy smart connected devices without fearing for their privacy or security. So do you think this is going to be sort of an uh, upstream uh, battle? Uh, because I, I presume there will be some resistance from uh, institutions like the NSA, the US government. Uh, when it comes to 
trying to keep the Internet of Things decentralized? Uh, yeah, it's a, probably to some extent there'll be a lot of concern about this, but I think in the long run, uh, people who really understand security understand that you cannot selectively weaken security. Uh, security uh, is the same for everyone. Um, if you if you if you weaken security for the purpose of a government agency, even if it is with the best of intentions, uh, you effectively weaken security for everybody. And so I think, on balance, the industry and, and many reasonable people are moving towards the view that um, uh, good security is good for everyone. But, I mean, beyond just good security, if it makes more sense, and we'll talk about the contents of the white paper, but if it makes more sense for devices to just talk to each other rather than going through some centralized server, uh, then then it makes more sense for the, the, the technology to be designed that way, regardless of any security implications or uh, any um, sort of, like, uh, surveillance implications that there may be. Absolutely. There's, uh, we are at the convergence of a number of really big uh, both technological and social trends which are, are driving us towards a new era in decentralized systems. And, um, I, I, you know, of course, there's the question of trust. And frankly speaking, I, I think we live in an era kind of almost after trust. The Internet started as an environment where academic institutions and government agencies operated in a very high environment of trust. We now live in an Internet era where I'm not sure I can trust any of the participants on the Internet. Um, so uh, how, how do you engage in computing after trust, or what we sometimes call trustless computing? Um, the second, though, is how do we architect systems in a way that's cost-effective and sustainable? And this is one of the things that really led us to thinking about the blockchain uh, as a mechanism for managing the Internet of Things because we think it has really enormous, dramatic uh, cost advantages over traditional centralized infrastructure. I mean, I think that's the, the part of your white paper that makes me the most uh, optimistic because I think I can certainly agree with you that you know it's it, this uh, surveillance state that we are in and moving increasingly, or it's getting worse. That is a you know it's it's an extreme threat to liberty and democracy, etc. Um, but I think if we have uh, the sort of economics as well on that side, right? If there is a strong economic incentive towards decentralization then I think that will just be something that will not be stoppable, right? I mean, if for companies it makes economic so much more sense to have it decentralized, then even the NSA and the U.S. government won't be able to keep it centralized. I, I think that is, a, is very clear in my mind. If, if, if that's not the case, right, if maybe you have a certain trade-off where you prefer from a security privacy perspective to have it centralized, but from maybe an economic perspective or, uh, let's put it, security perspective from the U.S. government uh, side, you know, they prefer it centralized, you know, then it becomes much more difficult. But I think that made, this made me very hopeful about uh, your paper. So I think the economic case for decentralization is really powerful. One of the things that um, got us interested in this is we've been thinking about, uh, and, and I should be clear when I say we, this was reflecting my time at IBM, in our interview today, I'm only going to talk about my personal perspective. I'm definitely not representing any official uh, viewpoint of IBM, just my personal opinion. But um, in my time working there, we started to hear from clients who were talking about how much it was for them to maintain centralized infrastructure for connected devices. And we started to think about whether or not that was necessary. In the early days of creating connected devices, we looked at the cost of computing power on the device, and we looked at the cost of computing power in a centralized environment, and we deliberately architected systems to move as much computing activity as possible into the cloud. At the time, that was the right thing to do. Computing power was more expensive, and uh, in the cloud, you could utilize it more efficiently. That incentive to centralize infrastructure is now flipped around. And what's flipping it around is the end of the embedded chip. So historically, if I was going to make a smart device, I would have done so on an embedded chip. Today, it's rapidly becoming cheaper to put an entire system on chip, basically almost an iPhone or an Android phone, on every device. And with that much power on every device, it's simpler to do the development in software, 
to do the customization in software and to put kind of the entire cloud infrastructure onto the device. So the economics of decentralization have changed radically over the last few years just as a result of Moore's law. So, so that's basically because, yeah, we had Moore's law uh, when it comes to chips and computing power, etc. But there hasn't been something uh, comparable when it came to uh, data and uh, the ability, uh, like the, especially the cost of, of transferring data. Is, is that the reason? Uh, so what, what's really driving it is um, the cost of Im two big things, right, on the, hard, on the technology side. One is from a hardware standpoint, um, historically the way companies developed embedded chips was a big non-recurring engineering cost followed by a very low marginal cost for each chip. Uh, now, you know, I can buy a dual-core system-on-chip with LTE, Wi-Fi, and GPS for about $10 a piece in volume. It's really hard to beat that. So you basically have an entire server that you can put on a light bulb. In fact, uh, I, I've got some friends at a Bitcoin mining company that actually reprogrammed one of their smart light bulbs to mine Bitcoin. Now, I don't know that that's a great use of a light bulb, but it shows you how much computing power is sitting on even the smallest embedded devices these days. So the hardware capability exists, but what was missing is a trusted, simple software architecture for managing a complex distributed application. And when we really started to understand Bitcoin, we realized it's a financial system, but if you take out the financial component, it's really an amazing decentralized transaction processing engine. And so we had the hardware and the software together that creates the ingredients to shift from a centralized world to a decentralized world. Those lots more to talk about, but before we do that, let's take a short break to talk about Shapeshift. Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to buy and sell altcoins. If you've ever tried to uh, buy and sell altcoins, you know how complicated that can be. You have to find a reputable exchange, create an account there, place an order, wait for the order to be fulfilled. That can take a long time with Shapeshift. Shapeshift uh, allows you to convert about 25 different altcoins and uh, they're all the time. So you just go to their website, shapeshift.io, and use their, their uh, currency conversion tool, tool, which looks a lot like Google Translate for cryptocurrencies. You choose the currency you want to convert. So for instance, Doge, Dogecoin, and also the currency you want to receive. So Bitcoin, for instance, and hit start. Once you do that, you'll be presented with uh, a uh, Dogecoin address and QR code, which you uh, would send Dogecoin to, and uh, those would be converted and sent to the Bitcoin address with no confirmations needed. So it's really fast. It takes anywhere anywhere between 30 seconds to a minute to uh, for that transaction to go through. And you don't even need, need to create an account. They don't even want your email address. So your privacy stays protected. And uh, did I mention it was fast? Because it is fast. It takes uh, no time at all. So Shift is the fast and easy way to buy and sell altcoins. And uh, we'd like to thank them for the support. Go to shapeshift.io to give it a try. Uh, before we kind of dive into the blockchain role, perhaps, can we spend a little bit more time on, on the idea that there are specific threats to IoT? I mean, it, it, it sounds almost like when you read your paper that sort of if it keeps continuing on the path we're on, you know, this is not going to end well and it's not going to be uh, financeable. And so w w what are those threats? So the Internet of Things is a great idea, but as you pointed out, there's a lot of reasons why it might not get as far as we'd like. One of them is fear about security and privacy. We talked a little bit about that. But almost as compelling as the fears about security and privacy are very legitimate concerns about the business model around the Internet of Things. Um, a lot of folks have this idea that they're going to sell a device, and on top of the device, people are going to pay a subscription, and then maybe to add to the they're going to have a um, they're going to have a revenue stream from either advertising or selling user data. And as we started to look at what's actually happening in the marketplace, we realized that these business model concepts are really, really optimistic. Uh, probably way too optimistic in a bunch of different ways. First of all, uh, consumers and enterprise customers don't seem to have a lot of interest in never-ending subscription fees. So uh, the devices that do well in the market are the ones that often come with no ongoing subscription fee. So that's one hole in your business model. Secondly, 
the uh, the business of selling advertising data or uh, user data is uh, pretty risky because in the internet the economics of information are different than the economics of physical goods. Physical goods have a marginal cost that's not zero, but if I've got two different providers who are selling roughly the same information, it could be how many parking spaces are near me here in San Francisco or what, uh, where are people uh, walking around shopping, if I can get two or three different providers of that data, uh, the marginal cost is zero and the market clearing price goes to zero. And sure enough, when we talk to people who are in this business, over and over again, what they said was, we're not getting the subscription revenue we want and we're not getting the advertising or the marketing data revenue we want. Uh, and so revenues, much lower than expected, Costs, on the other hand, much higher than expected because it costs a lot of money to maintain a centralized data center. So you put high costs together with low revenues and you get a money losing proposition and that's scaring off a lot of companies from making more investment. So in, so in that case, what essentially the proposition you're making is that the uh, business models associated to sort of the service side of the Internet of Things is not... Um, uh, is not scalable and it doesn't it doesn't work long term. That's right. It it doesn't. And uh, the experience of mobile phones and computers is a little bit misleading because if you take a mobile phone, it comes with a lot of free cloud services. But many of these phones they last for one or two years. So if your cloud service costs two or three dollars per user per year, uh, it's only a few bucks out of a perhaps a retail price of four or five hundred or more. Uh, that's that's a drop in the bucket, but when you're talking about the Internet of Things, well, I'm not going to replace my light bulbs and my doorknobs every two years. Uh, an LED light bulb has an expected lifespan of about 15 to 20 years in a residential uh, environment, and um, uh, it's selling for somewhere between 15 and 30 dollars today. There's no margin in that product to subsidize 30 years or 20 years of cloud services. So the business model, at least as many people conceive it, is broken. And okay, but so this this is uh, I was thinking about this right. So th perhaps there is not enough margin to sustain the hosting of cloud services and having that service provided to the to the to the uh, the, the users over that long period of time. However. I'm not sure I agree with the fact that these devices aren't going to get replaced anyway because people like to have new gadgets and new devices and new toys or whatnot. So that, uh, I like this is probably a short limb example, but this light bulb, um, although it has the lifespan of 20 years, when Philips or Samsung or whoever comes up with the next version that, I don't know, has disco ball functionality or strobe light functionality and that's desirable, people are going to want to update to that. Um, and also, you know, people are adding new light bulbs because houses are getting built uh, because uh, they may have new light fixtures in their homes or things like that. So it's not as though uh, these companies are not going to keep selling these products. They are going to sell, they're going to keep selling those products, but the installed base is going to keep going up. And in fact, uh, we did a little bit of research. The average age of a car on the road in the United States is 10 years. The average age of a house in the U.S. is currently about 40 years. And by the way, that's a lot younger than the average age of a house in Europe. So it's true, uh, installed base keeps going up, new product keeps selling, but the fact that new product is out there doesn't, um, doesn't eliminate the fact that you have to support the product that is still in the marketplace, uh, that's still being used. And so what we found was that um, you know, uh, over time, this infrastructure adds up to potentially a crushing financial burden, hundreds of millions of dollars for large enterprises uh, that might be supporting uh, uh, potentially billions of connected devices. Um, and so one of the things that we said about doing was starting to think, what, what can we do to drive costs down? Because uh, we don't see a lot of appetite for spending a lot more money on these services. Surely you don't want. To, I mean, I love a disco ball. I'd like a. I'd like a LED disco ball in my bathroom. That would be great. But do you want to pay an annual subscription for it? Uh, I um, I don't know if I pay a subscription. Maybe 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 a small subscription. No. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I mean, even if you pay a subscription for the light bulb, right? Are you going to pay a subscription or want that fancy new thing 
for the light bulb and the washing machine and the doorknob and you know the bedding sheet and that's the right. These, and these subscriptions just keep piling up and piling up, and then all of a sudden you're in a situation. And and, and also that novelty thing. I mean, of course, in some instances that will work, right, and for some things, but you can't expect that overall. For example, product replacement cycles and that sort of stuff will will dramatically shorten just because you know it's smart now and can do has like a new feature or something like that. At the end of the day, you know, I have a smart home because um, I'm love to play around with this stuff. I can switch on all the lights in my house. I even set up a script so that when I pulled up to the house, um, all the lights would come on and the door would unlock. And that was really cool the first time I did it. And then one night I came home after everyone else had gone to bed and that switched on all the lights in the house and made me really unpopular and that script was switched off and I haven't really gone back to figuring out what to do. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's nice to have smart functionality, but uh, in, in many cases it, it's still just easier to get up and switch on the light. And so uh, one of the other things that we really had to think a lot about was why? Why do we want this and what is the value proposition around the Internet of Things? I'm sure you could probably have some sort of IFTTT script that figures out if people in your house are also sleeping, and if they are, that it wouldn't turn the lights on. <laughs> I, well, I, I'm, the, I'm, a, I'm the biggest IFTTT uh, fanboy there is, but I need if, then, else, and, or, uh, right. and it doesn't seem to offer quite all of those things yet. So what, one, one sort of question I had about how this would work is, uh, so the, the, I guess the value proposition of having these cloud services, so you mentioned, uh, I think you use smart things in your home. I mean, one of the value propositions of the services they offer is this great user interface that allows you to connect then to, um, to IFTTT and sort of manage uh, all of the connected things in your home. If those companies are not providing that 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 that, that experience then are, are we proposing that the manufacturers are only making the stuff and then we leave it up to other companies to connect to the to these uh, devices and provide the proper UX and interaction between them um, that's a tough question to answer because I don't think that we know what it looks like yet. We're in an era of great experimentation. I, I think we know a couple of things for sure. Number one, nobody is going to live in the Samsung house or the Whirlpool house. We, we cannot live in a single ecosystem or a Google house. Uh, and so anything that ultimately takes hold is going to require a huge amounts of interoperability, which is something that most people haven't done a lot about yet. Um, secondly, I think uh, people are still struggling to nail down what the killer application is for smart connected devices. And uh, until, until people really get their hands around that, we're, there's going to be a lot of fumbling around. So, so can we talk a little bit about that, the, the, the question of what the core value proposition is of the Internet of Things? Absolutely. I, I feel very strongly that, that I think there's two big ones. Um, First of all, when it comes to kind of industrial applications or even consumer applications, the most important value proposition around the Internet of Things is asset utilization, making the things that we own do more for us. And then when it comes to individuals, to our personal things, especially a subcategory of, of Internet of Things, which is wearables, in my mind, it's really all about self-improvement. Yeah, no, that's a, that's actually an area that I'm uh, I'm personally very sort of interested and involved in because I'm also one of the organizers of the Quantum Pet Self Meetup here, and so I've been sort of you know closely following that very closely. And of course, it's the, the potential is is very big there. Although it's I think today a lot of these devices maybe don't quite deliver yet, um, you know what we want them to do. Um, so so I definitely see the use case there. Uh, can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on the, um, you know, making our assets, making our devices do more? Absolutely. So um, right now we live in a world where consumers and enterprises own assets. We own lots of stuff. The fact is our stuff doesn't do that much for us. It's, um, if we think about offices, uh, we think an office is busy when it's in use 35 to 40 hours a week. The week is 160 hours, right? The average car is only in use about 9% of the day. Uh, and so I believe that uh, asset utilization, getting more utilization out of cars, houses, offices, 
these are the things that create really colossal value. Um, if you look at somebody like Uber, uh, part of their value proposition is absolutely great user experience. And part of their value proposition is a little bit of regulatory arbitrage, right? They're, they're skipping out or bypassing some regulations that taxi companies normally, normally have to deal with. But a big chunk of their value proposition is utilization. Uber, dri Uber creates a liquid market for customers and taxi drivers in which to, to engage. And the data that we can see shows that people who participate in these markets, the drivers, for example, are quite a bit busier than drivers who use either traditional taxi services or uh, traditional limo services. Um, so it's all about increasing the utilization of assets and getting more value from them. And, and uh, the same thing is yeah. same thing is happening with Airbnb or VRBO for vacation homes. As the Internet of Things goes forward, they're going to be instrumenting billions of devices: cars, trucks, storage spaces, offices. All of those can be utilized much more efficiently. And, and of course, the interesting thing, right, is that you start having uh, marketplaces in those things, right? And you can have uh, maybe different pricing, right? I mean, uh, one of the things Uber is known for is that they adjust the prices depending on the demand, and so you can uh, you can kind of affect both supply and the demand, and I guess you could imagine something similar with, let's say, office space, where then on the weekend or in the evening it's cheaper per hour, and, and then maybe some people will shift their working hours to accommodate you know cheaper supply and, and those kind of things. So that's, I think that's really interesting, though, because you start having all these interactions and markets and possibilities that you know, they're, they're just not financial transactions there. There's no market. There, there are no, they're not really uh, used in that way at all today. That's right. It's too difficult today to create a digital marketplace for relatively smaller transactions. If you take something like borrowing somebody's car, um, if I want to borrow your car for two hours, I've got to meet you. I've got to, you've got to give me the keys. I've got to get it, bring it back to you, return the keys. Um, here in San Francisco, there's a startup called GetAround. They have uh, created a little electronic device that you can put in your car, and from that electronic device, you can locate the car you want to rent uh, from your smartphone. Using your smartphone, you can unlock the car, drive it away. Mileage and payments are all calculated by GPS, and when it's returned, the car is locked, and uh, the owner is told exactly where the car was returned. Um, and that's a perfect example of how the Internet of Things makes something that would be too difficult to do today actually pretty straightforward. Um, maybe one other question regarding um, the, the sort of decentralized uh, vision that you've been you've been painting be before maybe we can dive into that more. Uh, so you talked about surveillance. Do you think that consumers demand this and will demand this? Like a, I, a sort of surveillance proof and you know privacy honoring infrastructure? I think that the average consumer does not spend a lot of time thinking about surveillance or data privacy. However, I also believe that the average consumer, when it comes to buying these kinds of new services, they turn to people that they trust and respect and they ask them, what would you buy? Do you think this protects my privacy? And I think uh, a small number of people who care passionately about this have uh, come to believe that these highly centralized systems represent a major security risk. And so I think that small group of people is not only putting tremendous attention into this, but they are guiding the market in the right direction. And so I think ultimately uh, the winning strategies are going to be ones that respect security and privacy. Cool. Well, diving into your, your white paper a bit. So uh, the, the title of the white paper is uh, Device Democracy. Um, how did you guys come up with that title? So the origin of the title actually came right at the end of the paper. We spent a lot of time asking what are the business requirements, what are the technological changes going on, and we realized that decentralized systems, especially the blockchain, are the right mechanism and tool for creating a massively scalable, secure Internet of Things. And the blockchain, in a sense, is a kind of democracy. All the participants in the blockchain 
uh, contribute to its security and its effectiveness because they do in the, in Bitcoin they do transaction mining, and we foresee a similar kind of future where the strength of a Internet of Things blockchain or Internet of Things blockchains there might be many um, that comes from the participation of all of those. So we love this idea of thinking about it as device democracy, uh, decentralized and really in the hands of the users and the uh, device owners. So, so when we in in Bitcoin, right? There's the the mining provides the security, for example, by uh, you know hopefully uh, preventing uh, people to attack, and and you know if we assume that the majority of miners are honest, then we can rely on on Bitcoin transactions. Um, is there going to be mining in the Internet of Things uh, blockchain? Absolutely. It won't be quite the same as mining in the traditional Bitcoin blockchain. In the blockchain, for Bitcoin, mining is all about uh, both securing the blockchain and making it incrementally more difficult to issue new Bitcoins to manage the number of, of coins in circulation. We don't want to make it more difficult to to bring more devices onto a Internet of Things blockchain, but we want enough mining, you want enough cryptographic work to make sure that the blockchain is cryptographically secure and that transactions are secure. So, so there will be mining and there will be uh, what we might call a proof of stake, which is proof of device ownership or, or some other mechanism to show that you're participating in the blockchain for real. So, so, can, so will can, the devices be doing mining? I believe they will. I think every individual device will be able to do some mining. There's so much processing power. Uh, I, I mentioned before, I, I know some friends who got one of their smart light bulbs to mine Bitcoin. Um, there's processing power everywhere. There's no reason why it can't be used to help secure the Internet of Things. So this is, this is interesting because this is something I brought up with Vitalik. Uh, Brian, I don't know if you remember, but I, I, I mean, ever since I've... So I've been interested in Bitcoin. I, I've had this idea that one day all these internet-connected devices would be mining. And when I asked Vitalik about this, I don't remember exactly in what context, his response was, well, no, because usually these devices are all embedded systems. And in, the thing with, about embedded systems that, is that they're designed for one thing only, and there's very little extra processing uh, power that's left over after you're done just doing that one thing. And this sort of flips everything around because you're proposing that, in fact, we're not going to be using embedded systems. We're going to be using these systems on a chip, which would have a lot more processing power out of the box and, uh, and a potential for, uh, for I guess, this, these uh, um, uh, empty cycles or cycles not being used, which we could use uh, for mining. We, that's exactly it. We, we are about to experience a complete flip over. Vitalik is exactly right. Almost every embedded chip today doesn't have any power left over to do anything else. But um, typically, for example, I worked with an appliance company. They spend an average of $5 a chip today, $5 per product today on embedded electronics. Uh, that is pretty close to the $7 to $10 you're going to be able to get a system on chip for. Um, embedded chips take a long time to design and qualify. So within, with Moore's Law, within a couple of years, it's not just going to be cheaper to put an entire system on chip on your refrigerator or your blender or your doorknob. It's actually going to be faster because you can do all the customization and development in software. And so almost overnight, we're going to go from barely enough processing power to run the refrigerator to a thousand times more processing power than is necessary to run the refrigerator. Okay, and now with regards to mining and Bitcoin mining specifically, uh, I presume then that you're not proposing that we mine like the actual Bitcoin blockchain on these devices, but we're talking about some other blockchain uh, that doesn't require ASICs. That's right, because the Bit Bitcoin contains in it the feature of escalating mining complexity for the purpose of um, they can it's escalating escalating mining complexity for the purpose of limiting the output of new bitcoins. Um, it's the requirement today on Bitcoin is far far beyond what's necessary just to be cryptographically secure. Uh, what we just want is sufficient security that the blockchain itself functions, not to make it arbitrarily difficult. Um, 
But so here, of course, the question comes in with the electricity costs, right? Because if mining, uh, you know, if the point of mining for one of those devices is basically, is that to generate some revenues in terms of earning some sort of a currency? No, the, the purpose of mining is to claim kind of your share of participation in the blockchain to secure the blockchain, right, uh, and to make sure that transactions are processed correctly, right. The mining, what, what, what will protect and secure an Internet of Things blockchain from hijacking by any individual participant is if we have billions and billions and billions of devices out there, and those billions and billions of devices are all doing their own mining, then the amount of computing power required for a hostile participant to launch a 51% attack uh, is impossibly large. And so by having every device do some of the transaction processing and some of the mining, um, we are helping to secure the overall future of the, the blockchain for the Internet of Things. But then we will still need some sort of proof of work that is at least semi-resistant to ASICs, right? Uh, that's right. So you need reasonable, you need a, you need enough complexity for cryptographic security, but without it being arbitrarily complex. Uh, what I would argue is that um, it doesn't need to be a great deal if you're talking about having billions and billions and billions of devices able to do mining. Okay, now that's fascinating. I, I, I actually remember when I was at my first Bitcoin conference, I had um, dinner with Manny Rosenfeld, and he has been a doing a lot of work on, on mining and mining incentives and stuff. And, you, and we had this uh, conversation back then as well, you know, will, will the light bulb be doing mining and stuff? Uh, uh, super fascinating. So, because, uh, of course, this for, is for a totally different, for a totally different reason, right? Because then the, the device is not mining to generate revenue, but it's the device is mining to sort of, uh, assure its right to keep participating in this network and communicate with other devices. Exactly. Okay, cool. And, okay. Yeah. Sorry, could, could you, uh, so we mentioned transactions. It's unclear to me what exactly these transactions would represent it, unless there is some sort of financial uh, transaction going on, but in you know, if my light bulb needs to, I mean, if I, my smartphone needs to tell my light bulb that I'm walking into the house, there's no financial transaction there. What uh, does that transaction contain? So uh, a transaction, if we step back from it, a financial transaction is a transfer of money. But uh, a, a, from in computing terms, a, a transaction is just an exchange of information, a, a single step that's processed. So a tweet is a transaction for Twitter, right? A like is a transaction for Facebook. A door unlock is a transaction for uh, an Internet of Things device. So that's one thing, which is that actions are effectively transactions between devices. Uh, so that's one way of looking at transactions. The other thing is that although it might not be financial, we believe that many of these devices will actually participate in non-financial uh, marketplaces. So one of the use cases that IBM and Samsung worked on together is uh, how uh, washing machines and dishwashers and televisions and other home appliances work together to manage their consumption of electricity and how those, uh, they autonomously connect to each other and make sure that the house as a whole isn't consuming more electricity than, say, for example, might be, be being produced by the solar panels on the roof. Okay, so, but those transactions wouldn't be part of a blockchain, right? I mean, unless it's actually sending money around. No, they could be part of a blockchain. We could have an energy blockchain that would allow devices and okay. neighbors to trade electricity with each other. So, and in fact, there are a number of startups already that are looking at how to create distributed markets in energy, in bandwidth, in storage, right? You name it, these kind of digitized commodities, um, we can create both barter, based marketplaces and financial marketplaces around them. And in a world where even your light bulb has as much power as the original iPhone, uh, there's no reason why that's not possible. So so I guess one big challenge as well would be uh, scalability with that, no? Because, I mean, I think currently the Bitcoin blockchain, right, is, is, is very limited. And, uh, I mean, of course, people are trying to come up with more scalable blockchains and cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin itself is trying to scale more, 
Oh, that, that's very much of an unsolved problem. Uh, and how transaction do... times as well, because I mean, if if you need to send a transaction that uh, and an action needs to happen immediately, then the, that transaction needs to be. Yeah, fast. great point. So how how are these? How is that going to be solved? So uh, I would say we we came up with a mixture of things that we definitely could solve and things that we couldn't solve right away. Um, we talk about, I mean, just to give a bit of an analogy, we talk about Moore's Law all the time, but the fact is we don't exactly know how the next two or three generations of chips are going to be made, but we know that there's progress. I, I'm a real optimist. I think the progression that's being made on the blockchain and improving cryptocurrencies and, and distributed systems is enormous, so I'm confident that some of the basic issues of block size and uh, transaction processing volume can be overcome. Uh, very specifically in the work that IBM and Samsung did together and the detailed in the, the new white paper we just put out, IBM just put out called Empowering the Edge uh, last week, uh, we looked, we didn't just use the blockchain, we also added a couple of other pieces to address uh, a, a specific points. So we looked at the blockchain for, for transactions of record, we looked at a system called Telehash, which is a distributed messaging system that enabled uh, quick transactions, like I'm walking up to the door uh, and um, uh, I want to unlock it. And we also enabled BitTorrent as part of the architecture prototype for transferring very large file volumes. So uh, any complete integrated Internet of Things architecture is going to have more than just the blockchain. But I think the foundational underpinning is going to be the blockchain. And, and of course, uh, one of the cool things is going to be that if you you know if you have the blockchain, then of course the light bulb can have a Bitcoin address and and or uh, or some currency, uh, some cryptocurrency address and, and and make payments. And I guess also, I mean, you talked about sort of the barter use case, but then it could also be that right, the light bulb sells spare capacity to someone else, earns money back to for its owner. Um, I, I, I also thought one of the things while I was reading the paper that sort of came to mind that could be kind of interesting, right? So if you, it, it's sort of a new way of financing, uh, you know, um, financing devices, financing assets, is if you sell them uh, to a consumer, but sort of at a reduced rate, and in return, uh, all the revenues from maybe excess capacity that's being sold on a marketplace goes back to the manufacturer or maybe some third financing company, right? So you could actually imagine that, uh, it, you know, connected devices would be significantly cheaper because of that. I think so, and I think we'll see uh, a lot of, as the blockchain spreads, uh, one of the things that's great about the blockchain is it's an incredibly transparent and very secure marketplace. So when you see a history of transactions in the blockchain, you can trust it because it's been secured by all the participants. And against the trusted set of transactions, it's possible for us to do all kinds of insurance, financial services, right? In general, we talk about uh, we talked about at IBM the creation of the economy of things, right? So from the Internet of Things, just connected devices to a true economy where all of these devices both are interacting autonomously with people and with each other to create different marketplaces. Yeah, that, I mean this is sort of uh, touches on very similar to uh, what uh, Mike Hearn has talked about extensively in, in talks and on this show as well is is uh, a world where you have an, an Internet of Things and an economy of things where devices uh, are interacting with each other and there's um, uh, there's no human intervention uh, and just transaction with, transacting with each other. Today's magic word is connected. C-O-N-N-E-C-T-E-D. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. Now, with regards to uh, ADEPT, um, now you mentioned the three components, uh, bl blockchain technology, telehash, and BitTorrent. Uh, can you go more in depth as to what exactly is ADEPT? And perhaps it would be interesting to, uh, to, for you to lay out like one specific use case um, or perhaps a use case that we can imagine using ADEPT. Sure. So ADEPT stands for Autonomous Distributed peer-to-peer uh, -peer telemetry, I believe, and the idea behind it was to create a 
proof of concept that using the blockchain can allow us to do many of the same things that we see in traditional centralized infrastructure systems. So if you think about if this then that or smart things or a lot of the other centralized Internet of Things services out there, what we wanted to do was create a couple of use cases, not amazing state-of-the-art stuff, but show that using the blockchain we can deliver the same functionality in an entirely decentralized way. So we wanted to be able to move big files, we wanted to be able to secure transactions, and we wanted to be able to have kind of quick actions take place between devices. So the blockchain is there for securing the overall system and providing the management of contracts. Telehash is for rapid transport and uh, quick action. And BitTorrent is for moving very large files asynchronously. And in cooperation with Samsung, we developed a set of use cases which we showed it, for it live at uh, CES back in January. And those use cases uh, do very simple things. For example, showing how a washing machine can diagnose its own mechanical fault, check its warranty status with the manufacturing company, and then go into an online marketplace and request repair services. All of those things were done without any centralized infrastructure. Okay. Uh, so that was a good example of how it's, it's not earth-shattering stuff. Our purpose was to show very mundane things can be done uh, in exactly the same capability set as a distributed, as a centralized system, but without requiring any server infrastructure at all. So for each of those uh, actions that, that you mentioned, in, in what case is the telehash uh, messaging system used, in what case is the blockchain used, in what case is uh, BitTorrent used? Because it's, it's unclear to me when we would simply need to send messages through telehash or when we need to actually initiate a transaction on the blockchain? So, uh, for example, in the blockchain, we use it to establish the kind of originating records of the device and to establish contracts between, say, the device, the device owner, and the device manufacturer for things like ownership and warranty. Once those things are established and recorded in the blockchain, then uh, if we want to do a very quick command, like open up the door or unlock this process or start a washing cycle, that can be done by telehash provided that it's checking against an already recorded contract on the blockchain. Right, so okay. Blockchain is kind of the system of record. Telehash can be used for quick transactions and lookup. And then something like BitTorrent is very useful. Is let's say you want to transfer a huge file of diagnostic data to the manufacturer to figure out what's wrong with your washing machine. Um, you don't want to load that whole file into the blockchain. You just want to move it efficiently across the network. BitTorrent is amazing for that in terms of distributed file transport. Cool. This is so awesome. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that, I mean, I, I, I mean, it's still... Uh, so in, in this case, they used, they used Ethereum, I believe, uh, the Samsung uh, demo. Used yeah, Ethereum. the IBM Samsung demo was built on Ethereum, Telehash, and BitTorrent. Cool. So, uh, what's the what's the plan with that? Is the idea to um, actually uh, go from a proof of concept to um, an actual implementation that's going to be deployed? So, the the main plan with Adept was to get our hands wet and really get our feet wet and really understand um, what can this work and does it work? And in fact, uh, this last week, um, IBM published two new white papers on the topic. One's called Empowering the Edge, uh, which is all about kind of a, the big picture of the lessons that were learned um, doing this uh, uh, IoT demo. Uh, and then um, the other one is a related paper. It's called, it's the use case abstract, abstract that goes with it and it details all the use cases. So. Um, uh, from a proof of con concept standpoint, I think sort of mission accomplished, right? We, we know it works, right? Now, uh, I, I'm no longer with IBM, so I can't tell you what the plans are, but um, I can tell you being here in San Francisco and, and in Silicon Valley, the number of companies that are taking core pieces of uh, Bitcoin and blockchain technology and figuring out how to scale them and adapt them into... Uh, billions of devices is enormous. I saw a, a statistic the other day saying that an estimated $600 million is being invested in blockchain-related startups uh, here in the U.S. 
Yeah, yeah, I know. This is, uh, and I guess uh, also Twenty One Inc. You no, know, uh, the company has raised uh, like one hundred twelve million or something like that. I guess they haven't really said what they will do, but it definitely seems to involve some sort of hardware component. And uh, so, and I remember there was uh, some mention as well of the idea that, uh, well, first of all, hardware mining and um, mass market, right? So if you take these three together, uh, that sort of makes no sense in the current uh, mining environment because, like, it just makes no sense to create a hardware device that mines Bitcoin for the masses uh, because you have a complete move towards centralization because the economics are just that way. Uh, but in the sort of context of Internet of Things and what we've been talking about today, maybe one can sort of understand how these three things could go together. So I, yeah, it's, it, I don't want to speculate on what Twenty One is doing because I, I I really don't know. But I, I really am I'm very optim I in talking with lots and lots of Bitcoin and blockchain entrepreneurs, I would say uh, increasingly the shift is on how to use this tech. The focus is on how to use this technology to enable other processes rather than sort of the uh, purely focused on just uh, transactional mining in a in a digital currency. Now, is there any source code uh, out there for Adapt or anywhere people can contribute or or even use this for their own project? Uh, I'm not sure what IBM has chosen to release, and unfortunately, uh, I can't give you, you know, as I said, I, I'm really just here representing my own views. I'm not with IBM anymore, so uh, I don't know what their specific plans are. I think they've done some really cool stuff so far. I was really proud to be a part of that. and. Um, uh, in the work that I'm doing here in Silicon Valley and with some of the, the companies that I've been talking to, uh, the demand for this kind of capability is enormous. Uh, and I, we see that in startups and also in the uh, take up of platforms like Ethereum. And are, do you know of any other initiatives by any other companies that are trying to, are trying to tackle the same sort of problem and, and with similar solutions? I do, but I've signed a lot of NDAs. <laughs> so, okay, well, I guess I'll have to have you on uh, a little bit to talk about them when, once, they're, uh, once they're released to the public. So, uh, a listener had some, some interesting uh, comments in the Let's Talk Bitcoin forum because I asked like, if somebody has some questions on this. And, and one of the questions was, like, so if, you, if you're a developer interested in this area, what kind of, what should you focus on? Like, what kind of things are to keep in mind, I, I guess? So you don't build something that will, you know, not be future-proof. I think the single biggest opportunity for investment in the future is around development tools. Bitcoin is a new platform. Uh, at IBM, we sort of self-taught ourselves everything. Uh, same thing with Samsung engineers that we work with, who did an amazing job. Um, but it's hard, and it's much. If we think about how existing infrastructures built today. We're all building the same stuff based on the same set of open source components uh, and the same set of development tools. Uh, it's much, much harder to build the same capability using the blockchain or Ethereum. So we need a lot more development tools right now. I would say that's the, the number one opportunity in the short run is development tools. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, I, I actually work uh in the Ethereum office here in Berlin, and um, sort of have witnessed that to some extent, and I know some people building, trying to build actually complex applications on top of Ethereum now, and it's a, a hugely difficult thing apparently. So yeah, it's not it's not easy. It's not easy. I think um, it's it it will be incredibly rewarding as we get there. Uh, but right now, it's still uh, it, you can still tell how much of a frontier business this is. Absolutely. Um, so, how far do you think we'll get in the next three years? Um, that's a great question. I, I think uh, two or three years from now, we will have development tools. It will be uh, typical for people to start building distributed applications, and uh, we'll be talking about um, We'll be talking about kind of platform competition between traditional cloud services and distributed cloud services. Okay, cool. Do, and, you, do, you, yeah. do you think we'll? This is a, sort of something I was thinking about: is, is how do we make sure that 
connected devices will be able to will be talking the same language. So let's say let's imagine that Adapt uh, flourishes into this uh, really sort of nice toolkit for uh, on, on which you can build uh, in, on which companies will be building their infrastructure uh, and then maybe perhaps I don't know Intel or some other company comes up with a, a different protocol that uses similar technologies but isn't quite compatible will we get to some uh, do you think we'll get to some point where there are uh, multiple technology stacks sort of competing against each other and we'll run into similar problems where there's incompatibilities between them Oh, definitely. We're going to have that. The marketplace is going to ultimately decide which ones are the most attractive. We have that today, right? We have so many different variations of Unix and Linux. We'll have the same with the, the blockchain. Um, there'll be multiple blockchains and development environments. Um, in general, I would say that the market has, it seems like the technology has, industry has shifted from a time when standards were set and then technology was deployed. Now what tends to happen is standards get set quite a few years after the marketplace seems to have voted on whichever ones they like the most. Yeah, but I mean, so I guess that means that we'll be, we'll once again be in this uh, situation where you have to choose your ecosystem and, or people will have to develop other technologies on top of that so that uh, all of these standards can talk to each other. Yeah, although I, I don't think that'll be all, all that bad of a situation. The um, uh, this industry is incredibly adaptive, and even though there's lots of different versions of things like Linux, ultimately it's pretty easy to move between them, and they're 90% the same. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that at least in the short run, all this variability will produce a lot of innovation rather than uh, um, uh, more, more confusion. Cool. Well, uh, Paul, thanks so much for, for coming on today. Is there something else you want to you wanna mention or... Uh, I've got, uh, I'm going to be getting back into business very shortly, and so watch my Twitter feed at pbrody for an announcement in the next couple weeks. But other than that, I'm just uh, delighted to have been invited here, and I appreciate uh, your, your time, and it was a great honor. You know, absolutely. I mean, thanks so much for coming on. That was really, really fascinating uh, to talk with you about that. And I think it's, it's something that, you know, we, we sort of, uh, we're aware, I guess, of a certain intersection between Internet of Things and, and the blockchain, but certainly not at all to the extent, uh, at, at least personally, that I feel right now is like, oh, this is actually, it uh, could be an amazing, uh, amazing fit, an amazing opportunity. So um, it, it, I, my impression very much is that I guess this is a topic that will will come to revisit uh, often, perhaps also when there are more mature, actually, actually people perhaps developing blockchain cryptocurrency protocols specifically for that. I mean, I guess maybe Ethereum to an extent is that, but uh, I'm sure they won't be the only ones. Uh, I, I, so I really share your your, uh, your view, Brian. And I think that any time that we get to talk about really, talk about really practical things, and I, I, some, I really feel like this is sort of the somewhat coming to fruition of all these things we've been talking about in the last year, and especially you know, what uh, what Mike Hearn has been talking about uh, with uh, you know autonomous cars, etc. Were were with with this uh, with this setup technology starting to see how that could actually be um, applied to you know real life, and that's cool. So yeah, so Paul, thanks so much for coming on, and uh, all the best with your new uh, with new ventures and endeavors. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, look forward to perhaps having you back on at some point uh, to get an update on what's been going on in this area. Terrific. Thanks very much. Uh, and thanks for listening very much for listening. We'll be back uh, next week with another episode. If you want to, you can follow us on Twitter with epicenter BTC. Uh, and yeah, thanks, and we'll be back soon.